Well, you know, but sometimes they'll say, you know, I really object to a lot of uh, what you say, and it's uh, offensive to my moral system, but I really like the way you presented it, and I thought you were fair. Um, you've given me food for thought. I don't think I'll change my mind, but uh, thank you for st stimulating me to think. Wow, I haven't heard anything like that from people I've disagreed with uh, on the left for quite some time. And I don't, I don't know if, 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 if I don't know what's causing it. I think part of it may be that they were in an invisible war that people couldn't see between these mainstream publications and they would specifically address this issue and not that issue. Mm -hmm. And now as the internet culture has broken this game open, maybe they don't feel quite as embattled and they're, they could choose to continue in the previous uh, trajectory, but they're actually saying, no, you know, this, pay, this pays a dividend. If you're, if you're not going to be so potent in hunting us and making us feel like pariahs, that's real. That's really interesting. That they've been hunted for so long and mocked by mainstream for so long that now the internet caused a crack. People are really able to look at them a little bit differently, and they're showing a little, a little humanity right now because they realize that there's an opportunity to be treated a little different. It's self-preservation by them, but I, I'm fine with that. I believe in rational self-interest and self-preservation. Right, and I, and, I th and I think that you know, shame on any one of us who doesn't uh, accept uh, a hand that's offered in the spirit of friendship and investigation of the truth. And I've, I've had many hands offered to me. It doesn't mean I'm becoming them. I don't think that I've changed. But you know, just as the point that I, I made to you earlier, uh, once upon a time we had the party of Lincoln and the Dixocrats. And you know, even if what all that's happening is, is that your end goals have remain unchanged, what gets bound to those end goals like for example, interracial marriage of you know where I'm in an interracial marriage, it used to be the Communist Party was the only party that would support that, right? And so now it's you know every party would support it. Yeah. But the point is is that the labels and the bindings change, and I'm not going to be loyal, um, you know, just to the insignia. So I'm, is that is that the direct connection to their outrage that they've owned the narrative for so long because of mainstream accepting and pushing these ideas? academia, media, politically what was okay to say and what isn't okay to say, that the internet came in, blew it apart, and now the reason that they're so hysterical is because they're finally under scrutiny. You know yeah, what but I mean? they also got more desperate. So if yeah. you look at like affirmative action and the old you know, decisions in the 1970s, you could make the claim that the world had been so unequal that maybe we needed to do something very radical, right? But you've now had these, these various corrective measures for so long that even if um, we haven't gotten rid of lots of structural uh, problems, uh, things have gotten a lot better on many more fronts. And I think if you look at something like you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center, what does it choose to do Ugh. when it runs through actual you know, Klan meetings because there aren't enough Klansmen to watch? Okay, well, you know, now we have to find some growth industry. So let's find like, some of the most uh, enlightened, helpful people around uh, like, you know, Majid Nawaz, and, and we're going to go after him and paint a bullseye. It, well, God damn you. Yeah. you, you no, you're, you're not going to do that silently. It's not cute. It's not funny. You're going to get people killed, and you clearly don't care. Yeah. And thankfully, Majid is not taking it lying down. He's now preparing a, I think he's preparing a legal defense against, or he may go on the offense with them. Uh, but they, they did it to Ayan. They did it to Brigitte Gabriel, who I've had on the show, who I was a little nervous about having her on the show because so many people say she's this right-wing, evil, you know, monster. I had her on the show. It was one of the most enjoyable hours I've ever had of the most decent person sitting across from me telling me their story and their humanity. So let's make a point. Every time they tell us who we're not supposed to talk to, let's put that person towards the top of our list of people <laughs> we should probably talk to. Yeah. We, we got to reverse this thing because they need to lose that toy. Right, so they've yeah, been we've playing with too much. Too yeah, much. What, you know, which which camera can I look into? You can look into that one right, right. there. T Tucker Carlson. First of all, I haven't agreed with you very much over the years. Thank you so much for covering the story of Brett Weinstein. Uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, you know, it's not a, it's not a question of I begrudgingly say this. I'm just wholeheartedly uh, open in saying you know you 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 did something that needed to be done. And it should have been done uh, by everyone. It should have been done by the left. And we're not apologetic about it. We're not apologizing left, right, and center. You know, that was one of the huge things with Brett 
When is he going to apologize? You watch, mm -hmm. he's going to cave. Well, I've watched lots of people cave. I even watched Bill Maher cave. Mm -hmm. You know, he, this is completely crazy. And uh, that pressure um, is, has been stood up to only on the right, so far as I know. So credit where it's due. Yeah. Let's stop being scared. And oh. I, by the way, it doesn't mean that we're moving, I'm not moving to the right in order to say this. I'm, no, just, I'm just recognizing good work where good work is done. Yeah, well that's a perfect segue actually to another phrase that you came up with that I love, uh, the intersectional shakedown. Uh -huh. So we've talked a lot about intersectionality here. I think most of my audience understands that, but this shakedown addition that you added, I think has a really interesting component. It's sort of related to everything that happened to your brother. I'm looking for an apology from you and I'm looking for concessions. And what do I hold? I hold the ability to call you names. And if you don't do as I say, if you will not uh, surrender your agency, surrender your individuality, take on this junior status, which I'm gonna call ally. White people, get me some water. This is food for black people in case black people are hungry. No. <laughs> what you're doing is you're basically just baiting everybody with the one tool you have, which is if you don't toe the line, we're gonna call you names. And it, it's gonna limit your ability to move around the institutional universe. So to be clear, this is really a critique of, in the, in the case of Evergreen, this is a critique of the white students that were joining the fray, right? Because they were sort of, to prove how not racist they were, they were doing very anti-liberal things. So the shakedown was to take these guys and control these students, right? Absolutely, it's a, it's a protection racket where um, fundamentally, you take the weakest people who are embarrassed about their own culture, they're embarrassed about their own hide, and look, everyone should look at their own ethnic group and see what it does well, see what it does poorly. Being self-critical is a virtue, not a vice. But self-hatred uh, and self-flagellation and privileging the other uh, as some sort of advanced life form, as if we can't I mean, I do worry, for example, do these white kids have any black friends? Do they have any Muslim friends? Do they have friends who have immigrated from the developing world? Right. Because you, if you, mean, you mean in reality, not in just, you know, if you were to look, it all looks diverse. Yeah, everything. I mean, people who, uh, people who you trust uh, to make decisions for you in a hospital. Mm. Uh, because let me tell you, the developing world thinks that the West would be crazy to, de to give up on itself. Yes, it's got more entertaining dances or better food or some rich and storied history and great narratives uh, and art. But the fact of the matter is, is that the West has probably more attraction for, for, for those people than any other place. We, our amplifier is what distinguishes us. We have done everything more powerfully than every other group. And so it's not whether or not what we're doing is right or wrong because every culture does right and wrong. Um, but our amplifier is bigger. So, you know, if you plug in a Stratocaster to a huge stack built for a stadium and you make a mistake, I guarantee you, <laughs> they're gonna hear it three counties over. Right. On the other hand, if you play a fantastic solo, that's there too. And I don't understand, how, when did we give up on the West? I mean, this has been terrible, it's been wonderful, but it's the best thing we have going. I, there's a guy, you know, we do this fan show that we do. Uh, we've done a couple of them where I interview 20 people from all over the world. And the first one that we did, I interviewed a guy by the name, I think he's about 25, by the name of Kushal in India. And we, I follow him on Twitter now and he messages me a lot. And he constantly is saying to me, how are you guys giving it up? Do you realize you guys are giving it up? I'm so concerned for what's happening in your country right now. Do you realize what's happening? It's, it's started to happen here. There's, there's a lot of different things we can talk about with India. That's a whole other whole other thing. But every time he says it, I could feel it. I can feel it through the direct message. Like somebody that sees so much what, what we're just wasting away here. Well, it's funny you bring up India. I go to India a lot and I have a one rule, which is if I wanna make contact with India and its real culture, I never allow myself to become the honorary Indian because I'm a terrible Indian. I'm just not very <laughs> convincing. I've tried to speak a little Hindi. I care about the food, the music. When I go over there, I usually bring a harmonica I sometimes would bring a baseball cap. I amp up the American hmm. because that says I'm not coming to the potluck empty handed. I'm bringing my own culture and I'm not trying to be a junior version of you. And people show up at the potluck and man, you know, 
are they giving of uh, the crown jewels of their cultures? And, and you get that appreciation when you show pride in yourself, because otherwise you won't be able to receive the pride that they show in the things that they want to tell you. About. Yeah.